Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Oasis Church. Let's go ahead and stand up together this morning as we just declare uh, that our God reigns, that God is in control, and that there is joy this morning. You know, God saved us. He gave us life. He gave us eternal life. So we have a reason to be joyful this morning. So I encourage you to sing out, uh, to raise your hands if you're comfortable, and let's put our hands together. Here we go.
Yes, he is a wonderful God. He is exalted above any other, and there is none like him. We can go ahead and have a seat just for a moment here today. And today we're going to take communion. So if you didn't get a chance on your way in to grab any of those communion elements out on the table, we have, we have tables on each corner of the room. You can grab those elements there at any point. But today we're just going to celebrate what God has done in our lives. And he did that through the cross. You see, Jesus 2,000 years ago showed us his great love for us and that he, while we were all yet sinners, he died for us. And so today when we take this piece of bread and this cup of juice, that's simply what we're remembering today. We're remembering the fact that Jesus came and died, that his body was bruised and broken and beaten for us, and that he poured out his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You see, the Bible says where there is, where there is sin, the penalty is death. And so God took our penalty of our sin and he died in our place. So today we can be thankful, we can celebrate that we serve not only a God who died for us, but a God who rose again to give us victory over the grave, to give us victory over sin and death. So let's pray together this morning. God, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us a future. And God, today we just rest on your promises. We rest on you to know that even when life is difficult, God, you promise to be there with us. We may still have to go through that valley, but God, we trust in you and in you alone because you are right there standing next to us. God, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for giving us your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, as we continue to sing here today, um, I encourage you just to examine your own heart, to examine your life, to take this time uh, just between you and God and to thank him today for the cross.
the strength that carries me when I am on my knees. The cross reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. trust you today, even in the midst of confusion, even in the midst of struggles. We trust in you because we know that you are God and that you are faithful. It's in Jesus' name everybody said, amen. Well, amen. You can go and have a seat. I never really attended church. Ever. And I've gone through a lot of struggles um, and hardships in life. You know, just hearing your service and everything today um, made me feel like I should release myself to God and Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. And I receive Him. And I receive Him as my Lord and Savior as my Lord and Savior.
Is anybody ready to be changed by the Word of God today? Say amen. I want to welcome you to the Oasis, all of you in the house, all of you watching online. We love you and are so glad that you're here to worship with us. And we don't want you to miss anything. So we have some announcements that I'd like to illustrate for you on how you can get connected and stay connected. If you've never been to one of our open houses, uh, we invite you to that. We want you to be a part of that. And uh, that's this coming Sunday, this next Sunday, where it's going to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes together, introduce ourselves to each other, get to meet some of the leadership of the church. September groups, you may have already grabbed a catalog from out there in the lobby. We also have on our app all of the illustrated uh, groups that are available. I encourage you, number the 12th, uh, to check out the groups. Uh, we have some in the house here on Sunday and also on Wednesday and then in other people's homes. Also, if none of that works for you, just, uh, just do one on your own. We provide uh, as part of the outline on your app a series of questions. Uh, invite your friends over to your house, spend an hour together and go over those questions during the week if you cannot be a part of some of the groups that we have scheduled. Have your own group. We encourage that. Baptism Sunday is also September the 12th. For those of you who've never been baptized, this day is for you. You can pre-register. We'll have everything that you need for that. Um, the church app, if you've never filled out a Connect card, download our church app. Let us know that you're here. We'd love to send you a letter. We'd love to know when you started attending. FPU, check it. Check that out, what we have available for you. Do we have the video for one of the groups ready? Uh, we're going to just highlight one of the groups we have available. Hi, I'm Rick Green, America's Constitution Coach. I'm actually in the room where the Constitution was framed and where the Declaration was created and signed. This is Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know, a lot of times you ask yourself, how do I become a good citizen? What do I do to live out my freedom in this amazing nation? How do I honor those who came before me that sacrificed for me to be able to have this freedom? And as a believer, how do I live out a biblical citizenship in modern America? Well, we're gonna walk through all of those questions. We got a lot of great people that are gonna comment on that. And I'm gonna teach you in this very room where the Constitution and the Declaration were created. I'm gonna teach you the founding documents of America and the biblical worldview that was sown into our nation from the very beginning. So join us on this incredible journey, biblical citizenship in modern America. So that's one of our Wednesday night groups going to be right here uh, in the house. So check that out and everything else that's available throughout the week for that. Uh, this is a time in our worship where we shift gears and think about giving back to God. We worship through giving of finances. And if you're hearing about this, you've tuned in online for the very first time and you're going, what is this? Uh, check out all the information we have on our website about giving. We also have a video here to illustrate what it's about. As you prepare your hearts to give today, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for allowing us to give, that you gave to us, and you've asked us to do this thing financially. As 
well as in many other areas of our life, you want to be Lord. And I pray in this area that we would understand this concept, that we would get what it means to give. And we thank you that you gave your one and only son. As we prepare our hearts to give today, I pray that we would do so generously, freely, with an expectation that you're going to turn that gift into something special. I pray your blessings upon us today that we might glorify you through our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Two in this message series, Shake It Off. And we're not going to stand up and shake it off. But if you choose to stand up and shake it off at any time during the service, I'm sure nobody would mind. But we actually I pull this term, this title right out of the scriptures from a, 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 a famous passage, a passage that you might choose to memorize, a verse of scripture. We're going to read it together from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. If you'd read this with me, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. That word strip off or, or shake off literally uh, goes back to the Greek games when the runner would, would shake off and get rid of any excess weight or any garment that might hinder them from running the race. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at whatever that thing is or those things are that might hinder you, that weighs you down, that keeps you from running the race that God has set before you. And today we're going to talk about shaking off any polluting influences that might be in your life. And I just want to kind of get us into the message today by asking a couple of questions. Uh, how many of you like movies? I mean, I like movies. I I enjoy movies, not that I've seen any good movies lately, but one of the things that we do, we just got off break, is we watch, anybody ever seen Anne of Green Gables? It's one of our family's favorites. When we go to Michigan, we watch it every year. We didn't watch that this year for whatever reason. Uh, I remember uh, another movie, The Star. Anybody seen The Star? It's about, it's, a, it's an animated um, uh, uh, movie about Jesus' birth. And I remember watching that with my kids for the first time, and I, there was this scene, and it was just so touching, and my eyes are watering up. My kids are going, look, Dad's crying. You crying, Dad? And I'm going, no, i got something in my eye, kids. You know, and here I am bawling over just watching a movie there because, uh, you know, movies can, can affect you in such a way. I enjoy a good movie. Has anybody seen The, the Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, The Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, that, this is one of the most popular uh, films for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons this comedy came out in 2013, it was the movie. It was listed as the most vulgar and profane movie ever of all time with, with a variation of the F-bomb 569 times. That's about 20 seconds every 20 seconds in the movie. Yeah, that's what it became known for. And probably if you watch that, you're like, I didn't even catch that. You know, I didn't even see that, but, but that's what it's known for. And uh, I mean, it's, it's like when you see those things, we become numb to a lot of that, I think. Um, how many of you like watching mixed martial arts? You're like, after I had you raise your hands, I don't know about, you know, the UFC, cage fighting. Uh, I love watching MMA. In fact, when my wife and I got married, Ultimate Fighter just came out. We watched that for the next like several seasons. But when I first started watching cage fighting, that just turned my stomach to see these guys as years ago, they just beat, beat each other in the face. I didn't like it, but man, I love it now. In fact, when I'm watching it and I see a good pin or a good takedown, I say, kids, come in here and watch this takedown. Let's learn what to do. And that might reflect some of my parenting skills. We've talked about that recently, you know, but, but I just enjoy watching MMA fighting. <laughs> Could it be... Could it be, I'm just asking this question, that, that we've raised up, we've become a generation that's become so desensitized, some of the things that well, what we watch or see or view today or consume that we used to think was bad, and maybe it's just not that bad anymore, because chances are, some of you probably, on a regular basis, you consume things, whether it's movies, televisions, what you read, magazine articles, whatever it is, they might have a lot of F-bombs in them, they might take the Lord's name in vain, and we're, we're desensitized to some of that. I mean, if I were to throw out one F-bomb from up here right now, 
what would you think, right? You would tune me out because we'd go, what is this? But we're willing to consume some of this stuff, <clears throat> most likely on a regular basis. And so what we're talking about today is shaking off any polluting influences. And I want to see how it kind of shapes our life. If you're taking notes, if you have your church app open and you're looking at today's outline, uh, we have a definition for pollute, and it, it means to contaminate as with poisonous or harmful substances. And so we're talking about any polluting influences, anything that would contaminate us or pull us down or draw us away from following Jesus Christ and running the race in which he has called us to run that. Because you got to understand, there is an evil force in this world. He is Satan. He's called the deceiver, the father of lies. He's here to trip you up. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And guess what? He's not going to run at you with a pitchfork in his hand and with horns. No, that'd be too easy, right? You're too smart for that. You would know that. But what he does is he does this thing, what child molesters called grooming. If you've ever read about what child molesters do, they groom a child before they come in for the attack. What does that mean? It's, it's, they try to break down the kid's uh, defenses, whether it's over days or weeks or months or years. And it starts with a hug, and then it gets a little more intimate than that until the child molester comes in for the kill. That's grooming. Could it be that Satan grooms us by polluting us through our mind, through our environment, through the things that we take in, through the things that we consume, so eventually that one day he's going to weigh us down and come in for the attack to mess us up spiritually. What kind of influences, these polluting influences, am I talking about? Well, you tell me, because we all consume different things, right? I'll give you a list of a few things just to think about to get us started. We've already talked about movies, right? It could be the movies that we watch. It could be the television shows that we take in. It could be a magazine article that we see. It could be something that we uh, regularly view on the internet. <laughs> it could be the people that we allow to speak into our lives. Whatever it is that would pollute us, I want us to think about those things today. Uh, we already looked at a, de a definition of pollution uh, from the dictionary. Let's look at a definition from Scripture now, from Proverbs chapter 25. It says, like, muddied, like a muddied spring or a polluted well, is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. And for those of you who are Christians, could it be that we've become muddied, that we've become uh, polluted, like a polluted well, because of the things that we consume that we allow to come into our minds? So in a message like this, it'd be easy to go to two extremes. I could become very, very legalistic. And just call out some things that, hey, we should not do this. And make lists upon lists upon lists. And then the other extreme could be, I could just tread a little lightly, you know, and not really lean into this. And we'd all leave the same as we come in. I want to speak today from Scripture and just allow, to open the Scriptures and allow God to speak into your heart, into your mind, to identify and, and maybe push out some of these things that would be polluting us on a regular basis. So, so three things that I want you to consider when it comes to these influences, and that is number one, a little pollution goes a long way. <laughs> a little pollution goes a long way. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he's addressing the Corinthian church, and he's talking about a little yeast in the dough and how all the yeast, the little bit of yeast can just permeate through the entire batch of dough. And yeast in the scripture is a picture of sin. So when you read this, keep in mind that we're talking about sin here and how it affects the whole person. In 1 Corinthians 5, we read, Paul said this, Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Or we could say a little pollution, like, contaminates us. A little sin is easily contaminating us. Get rid of the old yeast. Get rid of the sin, right? Get, get rid of that pollution so that you may be a new batch without yeast. So a little contamination goes a long way, right? And I'll illustrate it like this. There's a 14-year-old boy. Goes to mom, says, mom, can I go to the movies tonight with my friends? 
And she's like, well, what's, what's it called? What's it rated? And he said, well, it's so-and-so. It's rated PG-13. I'm 14. I can go see that. And she said, well, do you know anything about the movie? And he said, well, yeah, I've heard a little bit about it. It's got some profanity in it, just a little bit, not that much bad stuff. And I heard it has just one little sex scene, but not that much bad stuff. And she said, well, let me think about it. In the meantime, I want to make you your favorite brownies. And he's like, Mom, you're awesome. He goes off, so Mom makes the brownies. She mixes it up. She goes out back into the yard and gets a, just a little spoonful of doggy poo. Anytime you can work doggy poo into a message, kids love it. A little doggy poo. She mixes it in there, bakes them up. Says, son, come in here, son. I've made your favorite brownies. They're ready. All right, Mom, but let me tell you first. I went out and just got a little bit of poo, mixed it into the batch, but you eat these, you can go to the movie tonight. And you can see where it's going, right? Mom, okay, I get the point. A little bit of poo goes a long way, right? So when you look at what you consume, I want you to be honest about this. Are there those things that you're letting into your life that has just a little bit of poo in it and might be affecting you in ways that you don't even see? I mean, you can take any example. And I thought of The Bachelorette, right? <laughs> the Bachelorette. I've never watched a full episode. I don't even know if I've watched a full segment. <laughs> but I read about it. You get all, all, the, all these guys together and this girl, and they meet each other. And within minutes, this is my soulmate. Oh, how, many, how crazy is that? I mean, seriously. And, and they t it's like, what is a, a, a dream life? What, what's a dream date? It's flying over the waterfalls in paradise. Right, and they do this. And, and what do they do on this show? I mean, I read about this. Like, oh, how do I know that you're going to be my perfect match? Well, let me spend the night with one person one night, and another person the next night, and another person the next night. And after three nights, well, I'll decide who I want to choose to be my soulmate for the rest of my life. I mean, is that just a little bit of poo? <laughs> Observation? I mean, is it really? And we got to ask, is this really? <laughs> what we want to consume because it, it's portraying, it's projecting a message in shows like this, right? What, what about a romance novel? We can talk about anything, but basically what's well, a romance novel? Well, my husband's not meeting my needs. Somebody else can. Like the pool guy. Oh, man, he is. He takes his shirt off when he comes over. He's got abs. And when he does that pool thing, oh, it just takes my breath away. And then it just happens. I mean, is that just a little bit of poo? I mean, and we're taking that in on a regular basis. I mean, seriously, but a little bit of poo, a little bit of yeast permeates, a little bit of sin can really permeate through the entire batch of dough. It goes a long way. Well, the second thing we need to just think about and consider when we're thinking about identifying the things that we consume, just because everybody's doing it, doesn't make it right. Sound like your mom. Your mom was right on this. I mean, she was. Amen. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. I want to look at a verse of Scripture we looked at last week in the NIV, the New International Version. I want to read it out of the message today. The message is not really a translation. It's paraphrased. It's more like a devotional uh, thing. But I, I like reading it out of here because it's very good. Romans chapter 2, it says, Do not become so, look, well-adjusted to your culture. And that's what many of us have, have done, including myself that you fit into it without even thinking because we've been polluted. We don't see the contamination, right? Instead, fix your attention on God because when we fix our attention on God, we're going to be, we're going to be what? Changed from the inside out. It goes on. Readily recognize what, he, what God wants from you. He's called you to run the race and quickly respond to it. Shake everything off. Why? So unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down because of its pollution to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops a well-formed maturity in you so you can grow and run the race. And we get so dragged down by the things in our culture. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that it's right. In reality, the majority can be wrong. And there's an illustration uh, about this in Numbers chapter 13 where the children of Israel are going to go take the promised land, the, the land of Canaan. 
and they send a, 12, a squad of 12 over, and they come back, and 10 guys give a bad report. We can't take the land. These guys are giants. Are you kidding me? And they go, you must be right. You're in the majority. But two go, no, God wants us to have this. We can do this thing. It's just amazing land. We can. But the majority wins because if the majority says it, it must be right, right? If you're in the minority, you must be wrong. And they didn't follow God's will for their life because they were polluted by fear. They were polluted by the majority. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that it's going to help you or that God's going to approve. So number one, a little bit of pollution is going to go a long way. Number two, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's right. Number three, if you're taking notes, just because I could doesn't mean I should. It just doesn't. And what I want to be very, very clear is we have such tremendous flexibility in Christ. We have so much freedom in Christ. I mean, we really do. I mean, could I speed on the way to church, on the way home in my car, and still love Jesus and still go to heaven? Yeah, yeah. But, but should I? I mean, should I? I mean, could I eat all the junk food that I wanted to eat? And never exercise and oh and eat, eat and still be a Christian and go to heaven. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. But should I? Should I go into debt to buy all these things that that nobody sees and, and to please people that I don't even like? I mean, do I really want it? Could I do that and still be a Christian and go to heaven? Yeah, but but should I do these things? There's so much freedom that we have in Christ. It's absolutely amazing. Desperate housewives, can I watch women have affairs over and over and over again and still be a Christian? Probably, <laughs> but should I? Eh, maybe not. Should you do these things? Look at what, and this is what I'm talking about. Look at what scripture tells us and, and warns us, frankly, in 1 Corinthians chapter six. It says, everything is permissible for me, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, repeats himself, but I will not be mastered by anything. There are some things that I could do that's not going to build me up. It's not going to make my walk with Christ closer. In fact, it's going to weigh me down and draw me away from Christ. And I mean, I'll give you an example on, on break. Uh, my best friend, we were on our way from Kentucky to Michigan his favorite bakery is in Shelbyville, Indiana, Lenny's. He ordered for us $91.99 worth of pastries. We picked them up on the way to Michigan. And I ate donuts and other pastries every day for 10 days, whether I wanted them or not. I'm now, I'm still detoxing from all of that poison. Could I do that? Yeah. Should I? <laughs> Probably not. Everything's permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Now, I want to be clear on this. We do have tremendous freedom. We do. We do. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to put forth some legalistic standards because this is what I think you should and should not do. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. You've got to go there in your own mind. For example, saying that you should never see an R-rated movie and every PG movie is fine. You know, I can't say that. It's just too arbitrary. I mean, the Passion of the Christ is rated R, and everybody should see that movie at some point. There are some G movies that I would never want my children to see because of the anti-Christian marriage, uh, uh, Christian message. So I cannot put a label, don't ever see our movies, because that's just too arbitrary, right? Um, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't listen to secular music. Now, I became a Christian at age 20. I got rid of all of my rock and roll music for two years because that's what I needed to do, but I'm not going to levy that on you and say, hey, you got to do that because it is legalistic. It doesn't mean that it's all going to say, we, we have so much freedom in Jesus Christ, so I'm not going to place the demand that I place on myself onto others, but the Bible says we're to be holy, hagias. We're to be holy, to be set apart, to be different. So your life, if your life doesn't look any different than your unchristian friends, you've got to ask yourself, am I running the race? 
that God set out before me? And you've got to evaluate what you consume. You've got to evaluate it, and you've got to think about it. Is this, am I different than my worldly counterparts? I mean, look at what 2 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 says. It says, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. What's Paul talking about? Well, he had this companion in the gospel that was just filled up with the love of Jesus. But eventually, because of, look, he loved this world. He was polluted and contaminated by this world. He didn't even see it, and he walked away from Paul. He walked away from the gospel is the implication here. Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, the the parable of the seed. And what did he say in Mark 4? He says, others are like the seed planted among the thorns. They hear the teaching, but their, their lives what? Become full of other things, the worries of this life, the love of money, everything else they want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're polluted. They're overwhelmed by the contamination in this world that they didn't shake off. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we evaluate what to consume or what not to consume? And and, and let me just say there are some things that are so incredibly obvious that you're going to see them, you're going to hear them, and you're going to go, you know, that's just obvious. I I shouldn't do that thing. For example, your friends say, hey, let's go to a movie. Well, what are are we going to go see? (laughs) Striptease. Well, by the title, you can presume that might be something that I shouldn't consume, right? Some things are just obvious. Or somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm just kind of praying about whether or not to go uh, to this bachelor party or not. And he said, well, what are you guys, what are you planning? And he said, well, they, they told me that uh, we're going to do some shots at the house and then we're going to go to the strip bar. I mean, I'm praying, what would Jesus do? I mean, some things, shouldn't they not be obvious? I mean, some things should be. Uh, But there are other times when it's not as obvious, like, should I read this book or or should I really watch this movie? Should I watch this new series that's coming out? Should I read this article? What do you do when you're not really sure? What do you do when you're not really sure? And some people would say, well, just follow your conscience. That's all well and good if your conscience says, well, maybe you shouldn't do that. But sometimes we talk over our conscience like, well, that's really not that bad, right? Because our conscience isn't really always a good guide because our conscience can become contaminated. In fact, the Bible writes about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, there are those whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. I mean, just take for the, 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 the really the benign example of me watching UFC. I used to think that ever turned my stomach. I love it now. How is that? It's because my conscience has been changed over time. There could be some things that are actually wrong and sinful, but after you do them for a while, it's like it's really not so bad because our consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. I mean, I've heard people say, well, one sex scene, that's not that bad. I can handle that. Profanity is no big deal. I'll group with that. I can handle that. The fact that something doesn't bother you could be an indicator. Am I contaminated by the world? Should I really consume this thing? So what do we do? I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's an awesome verse, one you might memorize. In fact, I want you to read that with me right now. Test everything. Hold on to the good Avoid every kind of evil. I mean, you test it. Is this thing good or not? If it's good, hey, we hold on to that. If it's evil, what are we going to do? We're going to avoid every kind of evil. What great advice. If it's good, hold on to it. If it's not, we'll get rid of it. Avoid it. Well, how do we test everything? Here's three questions. If you're taking notes, write this down. Ask yourself this Hey, am I being entertained by sin? If you're confused, should I consume this? Should I not? Is this contamination or pollution or not? Is this biblical or not? Is this wrong or right or not? Ask yourself, am I being entertained by sin? Is this movie, is this television show, this book, whatever it is, is is it wrong or am I being entertained by sin? Because a lot of people say, that movie was so funny. 
I know it had 569 versions of the F-bomb, but it was funny. If I told you a funny, dirty joke right up here right now, what would you think? Just because it's funny doesn't mean it's acceptable. Funny doesn't make it right or wrong. Funny doesn't make dirty right. So am I being entertained by sin? A second question, is it pleasing to God? Is it pleasing to God? Because listen, God's not my buddy. God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. The Bible says we cannot even behold the essence of God and live. God is holy and God is just. And we've got to ask, is this pleasing to God? Am I living in such a way that I'm bringing glory to God or am I being contaminated and tripped up by the world? Is this pleasing to God? Number three, does it lure me away from Christ? Does it take me off uh, out of, off the path? It take, does it take me out of the race? Does it weigh me down? Like Demas earlier, we read, he, he walked away from the gospel. Is, is what's happening to me over time, over the years, is it contaminating me in such a way that it lures me away from Jesus Christ. And here's the challenge. Some of you today might be going, preacher, man, I've heard you preach some awesome stuff, but you've just gone wacko on us today. And I, and I expect some of that. I mean, some of what I say should probably sound for, foreign to you, but, but I want to kind of explain it like this, if, if maybe you can understand what I mean. Like th three decades plus ago, um, things were different in our culture, in our society. There, there was a, a moral compass, a moral code in our culture in such a way that when I was a teenager, I mean, my friends and I, we, had, we didn't grow up in church. I didn't go to church till I was 20. We didn't grow up with any Christ influence, but there was a moral code in our culture. We didn't cuss in front of our parents. We didn't cuss in front of adults. We had that kind of moral code. Do we have that today? No. Um, when, when we turned 18 and we graduated high school, you know, we knew we were all going to get out of the house. Two of my best friends moved in together romantically, but it was taboo. There was a moral code. There was a compass back in that day. We didn't tell our parents. That just didn't happen back then. Now I have to explain that one was a male and one was a female because there was a moral compass, a moral code. But today, over three decades later, do we have that type of moral code in our culture? No, we do not. And the reason some of us might be saying, well, that's not so bad, is because we're living in a day and an age when there's no moral code. We've gotten away from the moral code. If we get back to the moral code, the moral compass, we can distinguish between that which is good and that which is bad because it, this has become foreign to us, even in our culture. So we, we got to start evaluating things to this moral compass and rather than comparing this thing to that thing as the world sees it. Well, it's not that bad. Some things are that bad. Now, right now, if I'm sitting where you are, I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my time? I can't read that book or watch that show or watch that movie. Well, let me give you some ideas. Worship God regularly. One of these connect groups that's coming up that you're like, I'd take too much time. Get into one. Read over that. Jump in. If, if you don't find any that you like, start one. Pray with your family. Start consuming things like the Word of God daily. You fill up on this thing. You consume this thing, and God is going to be able to change your heart in a positive way because it is so free, not because it's burdensome, but because the law of God is loving, it's true. So the message today, I'll give you a take home thing that you might remember. Stop consuming the poo. 
<laughs> I know, right? Stop consuming the poo. I mean, think about it. Uh, just think about how if we consumed God's Word and got rid of some of that stuff that's polluting us, how differently our lives could be. Would you pray with me today? <laughs> Father, I, I really do pray that no one walks out of here with this heavy feeling of condemnation or legalism, but instead that we would sense the true freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to shake off any of the contamination uh, that sickens us spiritually by allowing us to adhere uh, to your moral code in Scripture, that your word would reset our minds, that we'd be able to interpret everything that we consume based on your standards rather than the world's. I pray that you would remind us whenever we're being groomed by Satan and distracted from you, that we would develop a holy hatred for anything that's not pleasing to you. Remind us to test everything, to hold on to the good and to avoid the evil. And Lord, I pray for those today who've never yielded to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today is the day of salvation because in their search for what's important in life, what's fulfilling, that they'd find what they're searching for in Christ because he's the only one who's going to fill that void of what's needed. And I pray that we would get this, that a little yeast, a little sin permeates the entire batch, permeates in our entire soul. And you sent Jesus, your one and only son, to save us from our sin. And that today that somebody would take that step of faith to call upon the name of Jesus, to say, Jesus, take away my sin. I, I want you to be Lord of my life. And that they would place their faith in Christ. They'd be baptized in Christ, having all their sins washed away. I pray for that today as we call upon you to be our Lord. Oh, Lord, save us, Lord, from ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go and stand together one last time this morning as we close out today. And through every battle, and through every heartbreak, and through every circumstance, I believe you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place.
God, we believe in you. Yes, and everybody said amen and amen. Thank you for joining us.